um, but it'll be a nice day to finish up our, our conference this weekend. Uh, I want to thank the uh, McMillans for their hosting. They're not here today. Uh, they had to go to, I think, their daughter's church in Mechanicsburg today, but uh, you've all been so wonderful and gracious. I had a great time with the teens yesterday. These guys entertained me with their stories about pranking youth leaders. And uh, I gave them some suggestions even, so we'll see if they carry them out. I thought I had some pretty good ideas that came to mind, but I don't have to suffer the consequences. And then I thought, maybe they're going to do this to me, and that's why they're asking me. So, But it didn't happen. All my shoelaces were still in my shoes this morning. So I do appreciate that they were focused on non-destructive pranks, right? Things that could be fixed and cleaned up easily. The girls had some pretty devious thoughts, too. That was uh, kind of scary. <laughs> all right, this morning, uh, just as a reminder, I have all kinds of resources available to you. And in the coming weeks, a new series, new season of my podcast will release. Podcast episodes are short, seven to ten minutes. So uh, I don't like hour-long podcasts. I like really short, you know, less than 20 minutes, and that's what they're geared for all focused on practical suggestions of how to have effective gospel conversations with unbelievers. So I hope that can be a help to you. Uh, if you would like a, uh, an email twice a month in your inbox giving you more practical suggestions, you can scan that QR code or just go to the website apologeticsforthechurch.org and enter your information. And every two weeks, We'll send you just a very short email, it's not long, just some encouragement, some links to good sources, things that will help you do that. This morning we want to talk about very practically now, what does it look like to have an effective conversation with an unbeliever that leads to the gospel? And as we are continuing to use the metaphor Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3, planting seeds of the gospel. For those of you that have not been here the last couple days, what we've been talking about is thinking that in every conversation with an unbeliever where we can bring up spiritual topics, our goal is just to go as far in the conversation as we can, either to learn about what they believe and to ask some questions that challenge it or to tell them about the good news of Jesus. And we think about this as just planting seeds. Unless the Holy Spirit works in their heart, they won't come to Christ. And all I'm called to do is to go as far in the conversation as I can to try to tell them about Christ. And that is a seed planted. That is a success. So unlike the evangelism training I was given growing up, you don't have to actually lead someone to Christ for it to be successful. Now, that's wonderful if that happens, but your role in someone's salvation may simply be to go further to challenge them in their unbeliefs or to more clearly present Christ. So now we want to talk about what does an actual conversation look like. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Here Paul kind of gives us an overview of what we are seeking to do in a conversation that it's of spiritual nature. And in reality, when I'm sharing the truth of the gospel, it is a spiritual battle. And that's sometimes where we feel that fear, like, oh, I don't want this person to think I'm weird. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to come across as pushy. All these fears, and Satan will magnify those. Like, no, no, just, just maybe another time talk to them. Uh, and we need to go in with the boldness that the truth that we have in Christ is exactly what this person needs and that I can just have a conversation and see where it goes. Second Corinthians chapter three, Paul says this in verse, I'm sorry, second Corinthians 10, verse three. Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. That is, we live in this world in and sold bodies, human bodies, but we don't have a jihad. We don't have a holy war to take up with guns and swords. That's not what God calls the Christian to do. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. And the, the idea of a stronghold is a person's belief system in rejecting Christ is something they build in protection around themselves. All through a person's life, the different beliefs they accumulate, the experiences they have, 
if they're resisting the truth of the gospel, resisting the knowledge of God, they're building brick by brick a a defense against the truth of God. Remember in Romans 1, the knowledge of God is, is evident every day and the unbelievers actively pushing that away, suppressing that. Paul here says that you and I, with the power of the gospel, have the ability to destroy their strongholds, to devastate their belief systems. Notice in verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So the idea is not that we destroy that person, because remember 1 Peter 3 reminds us we're doing all of this with gentleness and respect out of a loving heart for this person, a desire to draw them to Christ. And yet what I'm trying to do is leave their belief system in shambles. The, the first night on Friday, I told you about the first time I ever tried to use apologetics. And the conversation went on for two and a half hours. And at the end of the conversation, the guy said, I don't even know what I believe anymore. Everything I believe when I came in here, you took away. That's what we're seeking to do, to show them that their unbelief cannot stand up to scrutiny, but the gospel of Christ can. So let's dive into this passage and some implications. And notice, first of all, number one, what I try to do in a conversation is to challenge the authority of the unbeliever's belief system, the non-Christian's belief system. So I will take time to ask questions to figure out what do they ultimately trust in for their belief system. And then I want to show that that belief system cannot provide the salvation that they're looking for. And we'll look at some of the things that people tend to believe in. And the way I do that then is I begin to ask questions that force that person to reveal the foundations of their beliefs. That is, I want to get to the heart of why do you believe what you believe? Where did you get this idea from? Because if I can focus on the source of their beliefs, it might be their church has taught this. Their priest taught that. A college professor taught this. I saw a YouTube video and this very persuasive guy said this. I saw a 10 second TikTok video and I was convinced. Like, we have to figure out what are they trusting in? Because if you can get to that, then you can begin to Focus your attention on that to show it cannot stand up. So I've developed all these questions that I typically ask. If you were to say, Mark, what does it look like when you have a conversation with an unbeliever? This, This is basically the kind of things I ask. And I've spent years crafting these questions. So every time you use them in a conversation, there's a royalty page. You go there, you pay your royalty. No. They're, they're so basic, you're going to say, I can't believe we're paying this guy. And others of you are like, wait a second, we're paying this guy? No, th- these are just basic questions. If you think that I have profound conversations with unbelievers, you'd be sorely disappointed. As we get to talking and start to talk about what they believe, I just ask simple questions like this. What do you mean by that? Well, all Christians are hypocrites. Oh, what, what do you mean by that, that term hypocrite? In other words, remember the old game of four square in elementary school? Four squares together, you bounce the ball, you hit the ball into the other person's square. When it comes into your square, you hit it into another person's square. So it's not that I'm avoiding giving answers, but when someone challenges me with something like, all Christians are hypocrites, rather than argue with them and go like this, head to head, I'm going to put the ball back in their court by saying, what do you mean by hypocrite? It's, it's a wonderful tactic to use because so many people assume the definition of words or they, as we'll see a little bit later, they're bluffing. And when you constantly put the ball back in their court and ask them for an answer, they quickly run out of answers. In my experience, most people think about an inch deep and a mile wide. You ask them on any subject, what do you think about the war in in Gaza with Israel or, or Ukraine? What do you think about you know, abortion or euthanasia or the economy? Everyone has an opinion, but as soon as you start to dig below that one inch, people don't have a lot of good reasons for why they believe what they believe. So I ask this one all the time. What do you mean by that? Why do you believe that? Well, I just think all religions are essentially the same. Oh, that's interesting. Why do you believe that? Have you studied many religions? And this is my, the common answer I hear. Well, no, not really. I just, that's my impression. Oh, 
Okay, well, actually, religions are quite different once you get below the surface. Here's another one. How do you know that? Don't you know that, you know, Christianity is primarily just a crutch for people and studies have shown? Oh, studies have shown. That's one of the great bluffing points. Studies have shown that religion is for those who need a crutch. Well, challenge that. Don't disagree with them. Ask them, where did you read that? Where do you get that from? How do you know that? Here's another one. What do you base that on? Well, I just think that... um, there's just no way that there can only be one way to, to be reconciled to God or to go to heaven. Oh, what do you base that belief on? Is it because you don't like the idea that there's only one way? Or do you think that there's an actual reason there can't be only one way? And again, what you're doing in each of these things is you're just asking questions. But you're forcing that other person to justify their beliefs, to give a good reason. And you'll be shocked at how few people can give good reasons for the things that they believe, which is a challenge to us as Christians, right? We ought to have good reasons for what we believe. People have asked me, what happens if they turn this tactic around on you? I hope they do. I want them to say, why do you believe that? Well, let me share with you what Jesus said. Let me tell you what the Bible says, because this is our source of authority for our belief. What happens if they don't believe it? It's okay, the word of God is powerful, even if they don't accept it as the word of God. And they might ask, well, how do you believe the Bible? And if I had another session to give, we could address that as well. But I hope people ask me questions for what I believe because I should have good answers for that. Here's some other basic questions. How have you come to that conclusion? Well, I just think that God, you know, ultimately will accept everyone. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Um, How have you come to that conclusion? Uh, have, you, have you read somewhere in, in the Bible or some other authoritative reading? Like, have you thought this through? Put the ball back in their court and watch them flounder. Very rarely do I meet pe- people who have good answers for questions like this. Where did you get that idea? Well, I just think that Jesus was um, a good teacher and we've blown out of proportion who he is. He's not God. He's just a good teacher. Oh, where did you get that idea? When I was going through chemotherapy four years ago, um, when I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, we have a great cancer center in Lancaster and I would go. And I always thought it would be like the movies where you go and you sit in a room with everybody else getting chemo and you play cards. So I'm thinking this is going to be so fruitful for evangelistic conversations. Like I'll be playing cards or checkers with people and we'll talk about Jesus all the time and about death and dying. And instead they stick each person in their own individual room by themselves. And I thought, oh, this is disappointing. Uh, The uber evangelist in me was ready to use chemo as a as a way, but God still gave me opportunities with the nurses who were giving the infusions. And one day a guy was walking around to all the rooms talking. He was a volunteer. He was an older retired gentleman. And um, I had a theology book there that I would occasionally read in between naps. When you're on chemo, they give you a lot of things to make you sleepy. So you don't have to sit there awake for six hours or so. And so he saw the theology book and said, oh, theology, how interesting. And Uh, He says, you know, I I really think highly of Jesus. I said, oh, you do? I said, are you a Christian? Well, you know, kind of. Um, You know, I really like the things that Jesus said when he said things like, love your neighbor as yourself and don't judge. I said, yeah, those, those are good things Jesus said. But do you also believe when Jesus said, I am God and no one comes to God except through me? And his response was, well, we don't know if he said those things. I said, that's so interesting that you believe Jesus says the things that you like, but the things you're not so sure about, you don't know if he really said those things, that those might have been added later. And so I asked him this question, where did you get that idea? Well, I just, you know, it doesn't seem to fit with the Jesus I had in mind. I wasn't feeling particularly well that day. So I said, well, to be honest, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't have any respect for Jesus whatsoever. And he kind of stiffened, like, he said, why would you say that? I said, because Jesus claimed clearly he is God in the flesh, that he has come to provide salvation. 
He was not just a good teacher because a good teacher wouldn't claim to be God and wouldn't claim to be the only way to God and that those who didn't believe in him would be thrown into outer darkness. So you either have to be intellectually honest and take Jesus at everything he said or don't take him at all. And I thought, oh boy, how's this going to go over? And his response was, I've never thought about it that way before. Maybe I should go back and read the Gospels again and reconsider. So challenging people by asking questions like that, where did you get this idea, is a great way to force them to think about the things that they believe. Here's another one. Who said that? Well, this scientist I know said that, you know, we can do away with religion. Okay, who, who was that? And they might come up with a, an answer or so, but there are no arguments from science or philosophy or history that disprove the Christian faith. That's one of the things I often encourage my students at Lancaster Bible College is there is no legitimate criticism that can be raised against the Christian faith for which there are not many good answers. It's true. In my own personal study, I dove deep into every area I could think of to, to find out, are there questions that we can't answer? So in the years that I was a pastor, I went back to school for a research degree in New Testament. I spent a semester at Harvard Divinity School studying uh, the early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. I was the only Christian in the class. The professor was probably one of the top three or four scholars in the world on the New Testament text as it was originally written in Greek. And he was an atheist. Spent his entire life studying the Greek New Testament and didn't believe a word of it. And throughout the whole class, through the whole semester, he sought to show that the, the New Testament is an unreliable mess. But what he proved what it is, is that it's extremely reliable. The proof was in the pudding in the manuscripts that we looked at. A few years later, I went to uh, Villanova for a year and studied German philosophy, thinking there might be some arguments in philosophy that we don't have good answers to. And there aren't. There aren't. Remember the first day of class, we were reading the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. And the professor said, there are no, um, there are no proper interpretations of his writings, only misinterpretations. Think about that for a while. So I was an older student. I was in my 40s at that time. I was not intimidated by him. The other students in their 20s are like, yeah, that's so wise, so interesting. Uh, if Talon was here, he could stroke his mustache. We talked about that. When we were making plans to prank someone yesterday with the teens, he was stroking his mustache. And I thought, here's an evil genius in the making, I think. So all the students are thinking, oh, that's so profound. There's only misinterpretations. And I wasn't impressed, so I raised my hand and I said, then we should all get A's because all we can do is give misunderstandings of this philosopher. And the professor's response was, well, there are, are acceptable misinterpretations and unacceptable misinterpretations. <laughs> that's intellectual hypocrisy. So by asking these type of questions, you're forcing that person you're talking to to try to justify their beliefs, and very few people can. And even if they do give an answer, you'll immediately see holes in the answer, problems in the answer. Here's another one. Is that source reliable? Can you give me an example of that? These are all just varieties of the same question. Someone says, here's what I believe. Ask questions. Don't argue with them. Don't do this. Ask questions and see if they can justify what they believe. Secondly, we want to challenge arguments against the Christian worldview. So I'm going to move on. I know that those of you that like to write down everything on the slide, this is the way it is in class. Diligent students are like, wait, wait, Dr. Farnham, don't switch the slides yet. And all the others are like, nah, I'm not going to bother writing that down. Just keep going. Here's what we want to do. Here's, our, here's some of the authorities that people trust in. Science. This is not in your notes, just an example. Some people say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. What they mean by that is they believe that only what can be observed through the scientific method is fact, and Christianity is faith, not knowledge. You believe something you can't see, and their conclusion is God is not provable by science and is therefore unbelievable. This is actually a religion that we call scientism because Good science done correctly doesn't, doesn't hold to this. Good scientists know that we can know things other ways than just by science. Right? Any of you have a good, strong sense of intuition? Yeah. 
you're playing in the, or not you're playing, your kids are playing in the other room, and suddenly it gets quiet. Every mother's radar starts to blare. Wah, 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 warning, no sounds coming from the other room. You know something's not right, and that's not scientifically provable, that's intuition. Memories, our memories are not scientifically provable. They can't crack your skull open, look at your brain, and see your memories. And yet, we all know that memory is important, otherwise you wouldn't know which car is yours in the parking lot and how to get home, or which home you live in. A memory is not a provable thing, and yet we know that memory is part of the human experience. So some people think science has all the answers, and science has many wonderful answers, but it cannot answer spiritual questions. It cannot deal with immaterial realities. Uh, here's a good quote. A few years ago in England, uh, atheists got together and they created an advertising campaign. And here's one of the uh, billboards that they put on the side of a bus. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. So if you're going to ask a question, if someone said something like this, what might you ask? What word is problematic in this? Probably, yeah. In other words, they're, they're playing the odds. And that's what we have casinos for, or horse races. I don't know, I'm not a gambler. Um, probably. But, you know, there's another word in that statement that is also problematic. It's the word enjoy. Is that all life is, is just enjoyment? What happens when someone you love is very sick or dies? Uh, not long ago, my wife and I were helping a young couple whose five-year-old son uh, was getting ready to, he was four, we were getting ready to celebrate his fifth birthday in a few weeks, very excited, began to have headaches. They took him to the hospital, found a brain tumor. They uh, had surgery done. The doctor said, there's not much we can do. Over the next three months, this five-year-old died. How are they going to go out enjoying their life? It's been a little over a year, and they are still grieving the loss of their son. So this whole campaign, just, you know, just go and enjoy your life, limits life to just a question of enjoyment when life includes so much more than just enjoyment. Here's another statement from Catherine Hepburn. I'm an atheist, and that's it. I believe there's nothing we can know except that we should be kind to each other and do what we can for other people. So if someone said that to you, what question might you ask them? A couple questions we could ask this. How do you know that that's the only thing we can know, right? What she's saying is, I have, I have climbed the summit of human knowledge, and I'm looking down on all you foolish people who think that you can believe in truth, but this is the only thing we can know to be kind to one another. But my question is, why kind? If there is no God, my way might be cruelty and aggression, right? Because there's no morals, and I might find cruelty and aggression works really good for me. And I hope you all choose kindness, because it'll be all that easier to exploit you. Where did she get the idea that we only know that we should be kind to one another? This is a, a, a contradictory belief system. And yet many people you meet would probably hold to this. Listen, we can't argue about truth. Just love your neighbor. Oh, that thing that Jesus said, love your neighbor is yourself. How convenient. Let's just take the parts of Christianity we like. So you can challenge us by simply asking a question. Here's another one. You can be good without God. What question might you ask someone who says this? What do you mean by good? Here's what, here's what atheists and unbelievers are doing when they say things like this. They're borrowing the Christian idea of good. Recently, an unsaved historian named Tom Holland, not the guy who plays Spider-Man, wrote a book called Dominion, in which he, again, as an unbelieving historian, said, until Christianity came along, the idea of individual rights and each person have, having worth in and of themselves did not exist in the world. That came in through Christianity. And so people that say, we don't want Christianity more, but we want to maintain a, uh, treating people with dignity and respecting life, uh, you can't get rid of Christianity and hang on to that. That doesn't fit in an evolutionary worldview. An evolutionary worldview where there is no God and natural selection runs everything, all that matters is that you are stronger than the person next to you, more fit than the 
than the family that lives next to you. And you will survive and they will die. And if you have to, you take them out as well. But so many people want to live with Christian morality while not accepting the basis for that. For other people, their authority is reason. They think only that which the mind and society deem to be reasonable is true. So let's be reasonable here. But again, apart from the Christian faith, reason is just an evolutionary biological function and there's no set standard that says how we should think. For some people, religion is the standard. Well, my priest, my pastor, my church says this. And as Christians, we have to be careful not to fall into that either. As much as your pastor is a wonderful man, this is a wonderful church, where do we root our beliefs in the scriptures? Unashamedly. Well, what a oh, $5 bill fell out of my, uh, I should shake it more often, see what comes out of that. <laughs> what if my pastor's wrong? Well, it shakes a lot of people's faith when they find out their pastor or their priest or their minister or their rabbi or their imam is wrong. For us, we rely on the scriptures because it has proven itself for 2,000 years and more. So I want to challenge people. How do you know that what you believe is true? Let's move on then to number two. We want to seek to, in a conversation, challenge their arguments against the Christian worldview. And this is something we have to discipline ourselves to do. When you have the opportunity to witness to someone... Before you jump in and tell them the whole story of the gospel, take some time to say, now, what do you believe about these things? How do you think we are reconciled to God? How do you think we find forgiveness for sins? What do you think is wrong with the world? What will make it better? Listen to what they have to say so that as you answer them, you can counter their arguments point by point. And one of the things that we can do is test the consistency and livability of their worldview. That is, would this really work in real life? That's what livability means. So a number of years ago, I, uh, through some of my students, I befriended the founder of the um, Lancaster Free Thought Society, the local atheist group. And they meet once a month, and I send my students from my apologetics class to go there to experience what it's like for a group of atheists to sit around. And mostly what it is is not really a free thought society at all. It's an anti-Christian rant. They don't complain about Islam or other religions. It's just people that grew up in quasi-Christian denominations, and they come together and they complain about that. So I got to know the founder, and uh, at the end of every semester, when I had taught my class apologetics for the semester, I'd allow him to come in, and he could present his best case for, case for atheism. And then the students would be able to ask him questions. And many times before that he would do that, we'd go out for coffee and we would talk, and um, I didn't really enjoy it because he was not a reasonable person. He would say things like, I don't believe in right and wrong. I said, oh, so if someone broke into your house and harmed your wife and kids, you wouldn't think that was wrong? He would said, no, I don't think it's wrong. It's just not the way society flourishes. I'm like, you're just trying to be consistent with your belief system, but there's no way you can believe that. And uh, it was very frustrating talking with him because he wanted to limit uh, all, he said, we don't need any morality from religion. We just need empathy for one another. I said, empathy, that's it. Yeah, just, just be concerned about other people, feel what they feel. That's the only ethic that we need. And I would say to him, that's not livable. Number one, you can't make people be empathetic. But then number two, that's so vague. The doctor who's performing an abortion thinks he is doing good by taking this woman's baby when she doesn't want the baby. He is, thinks he's being empathetic. He's thinking he's some, doing something good. Last year in Canada, Canada euthanized 20,000 older people last year, some against their will because they've decided we cannot use resources to keep older people alive that could go toward younger people who could have a quality of life. And they do that in the name of empathy. So the problem is empathy is not a strong enough belief system or moral system to actually guide society. It fails. So we used to go round and round this guy, and every time I'm like, i got to stop having coffee with this guy because he's driving me crazy. Not, not, not every atheist or unbeliever is like this, but this guy was determined never to admit that I was right about anything. And I'm like, I'm not doing this again. And then we'd finish coffee. He'd say, this was fun. Let's do it again. Fine, whatever, <laughs> if you want to. 
Um, I never got anywhere with him, but the present leaders of the local atheist group, I'm getting somewhere with them. We have conversations and I'm seeing progress. So part of our Christian witness is we cannot be afraid of groups of people who might even be antagonistic to us. Go and meet with them. Have a conversation with them. You'll see them as a human made in God's image in rebellion against God. They need the gospel. They will see you as a human. They might think you're crazy, but that's okay. Show kindness to them. That's what Jesus would do. Here's another thing we want to do. We want to, whoops, the words didn't get through on that one, but we want to call his bluff. Call his bluff. Sometimes people will bluff. They'll say something that's not true, and they'll hope that you won't catch them on that. So this same guy was in class one time, and he said to the students, he said, don't you know? He said, first of all, students, do you believe that God literally delivered millions of people out of Egyptian slavery, brought them through the Red Sea, and then brought them to the promised land. Do you really believe that? And all the students said, yes, we do. And he said, don't you know that there were so many people, by the time the first ones got to the edge of the promised land, the last ones wouldn't have even been through the Red Sea? Because you can't fit that many people in that space. And I had never heard that before. The students didn't, and they were scratching their heads thinking, boy, I don't, we don't know how to answer him. So I always sat off on the side while he grilled the students to give them a chance to experience that. So I Googled that, and, and uh, he said, don't you know that area is the size of Rhode Island and that, that you couldn't fit that many people in there? And immediately I started to smell something that wasn't right. Because when I was a pastor, I pastored just a few miles from the Rhode Island border along the Connecticut coast, and Rhode Island has 800,000 people in the state, but when you drive through, it looks like it's been abandoned until you get to Providence. Because it could easily fit millions of people, but it, there's hardly anyone there, even though there's 800,000. In addition, that area where he said was only the size of Rhode Island is much bigger than that. So he was bluffing, hoping to cause some doubt in the minds of the students, and many times people will do that. They'll say things like, don't you know that you're more likely to be killed by a white conservative Christian in this country than you are by a terrorist? Like people have made that claim. Well, it's on the spur of the moment. We don't know how to answer that, but it's simply a bluff. It's, it's not true. And people will say many things like that. Another thing we want to do is correct his misconceptions about the Christian faith. That is, don't assume that the unbelievers you meet understand the gospel clearly and just don't believe it. Many times they have distorted ideas. They'll say things like, well, I, you know, I think people go to church and, and like Christianity because it provides rules and structure for their lives. And you want to tell them that's not what the Christian faith is about. Yes, God reveals moral laws to us he wants us to keep, but that's for our good. But we're not saved through keeping the law because none of us keep the law. Rather, it's about being reconciled to the God who made us. It's all about recognizing the, the worth and value of Jesus who came and died on the cross to pay for our sins because he loved us even when we were unlovable. So this is why you want to take the time to ask people, what do you think Christianity is all about? What do you think is the right way to be reconciled to God, to be forgiven for our sins? Ask them that first so then you can correct their misconceptions. Show how the Christian faith can answer any legitimate challenge leveled against it. That is, we should not be afraid of the objections people ask. Now, many times people will ask me something and I'll say, oh, that's a good question. I'm going to have to look that up because I've not heard that one before. That happens to everyone. But don't be afraid to hear those objections. Sometimes we think, I don't want people to ask me anything I don't have an answer for, so I'm either going to spend 10 years studying apologetics and then I'll start witnessing, or I'm just going to avoid it unless someone comes to me and says, you know, you're just such a nice, kind person. I just wondered if I could have the same religion as you. Has anybody had that happen? It might happen once in a great while, but I got to tell you, just being nice and kind is not going to draw most people to you to want to know why you are. We've got to open our mouths and speak. Maybe you've heard of that famous quote by St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel often, use words when necessary. Have you heard that before? Francis of Assisi never said that, and it's wrong anyways. So I don't mean to say if Ethan ever uses it, shout him down, but... 
You should never do that to your pastor anyways. But it's not true. We are called to speak. We are called to tell people. And um, we should study our faith well enough so that we know when people ask questions, I have at least some way to answer. But in addition to that, if you don't know, say so. It's perfectly okay to say, that's a great question. I have no idea how to answer it. I'll try to find an answer for you. But that doesn't necessarily dismantle my faith or prove me wrong. So what do we want to do? So here's what I'm looking for. When I'm talking to a person and I'm asking questions, I'm trying to get to several important points. There's a great book out by a um, a scholar named Dan Strange, Daniel Strange, called Making Faith Magnetic. It's a very easy read. I used to have copies of it in my book sale, but I've sold out of it. So I encourage you to get Making Faith Magnetic. He says, everyone wonders about five things. First of all, totality. What is our purpose? He said, everyone wonders that at times. Why am I here? Right? Children at some point begin to think about who they are and and, and what they're here for. Teenagers wrestle with this issue. Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Midlife crises happen, right? Because people look at their life and say, what am I doing with my life? Or how did I get here? So many people wrestle with this, and you can ask questions like that. Why do you think that we're here? Why do you think we, you know, we were put on this earth? And let them talk. Let them answer. And then you can tell them, that's really interesting. I agree with some of that, but here's why I think we were put here. We are here to glorify God. And that is the purpose of Christians. We are not here merely to witness to other people. That's a popular conception. That's part of it. But we are here to glorify God, which means everything in my life should please God. It's not okay if I witness to people all the time, but my life is a disaster and a wreck. If I'm living in sin, glorifying God means I pay close attention to my heart and I seek to live a godly life. I repent of sin when the Holy Spirit convicts me. I'm growing in virtue. I'm growing in character. And as I do that, I'm sharing the good news of Jesus. When I worship, when I go to work, when I change a diaper, all of that can be done for the glory of God so that I can find my purpose every day as a Christian in everything I do if I'm doing it for God. You might say, I really don't have much to do productively anymore in my life. That's okay. Everything you do, everyone you pray for, every act of kindness that you do for someone else if you're doing it for the Lord is fulfilling the purpose for which God put you here. Therefore, as Christians, we should have a strong connection that I am fulfilling the purpose. And God will leave me here on this earth to glorify him. And part of that is witnessing to people. But as long as God leaves me here, I'm going to seek to please him in everything that I do. So that we as Christians shouldn't actually be torn apart all the time about why we're here and what we're doing with our lives. Uh, I, every, uh, every day I get a, a Wall Street Journal update because it's one of my favorite newspapers to read. And on Friday, they had a, a, a statement that we all know this to be true. Major study shows that people who faithfully attend church have much higher levels of mental health, much lower levels of anxiety and stress. That should be no surprise to us, right? And the article written by an unbeliever goes on to say that this sense of community and purpose And weekly gathering provides for many people outlets for that which otherwise damages mental health. So ask questions of your unbelieving friends and family and coworkers and neighbors. You know, why do you think we're here? As we talked about the last few days, sometimes people say, I don't really like to talk about those things. I'll try one more thing. I'll say, really, why not? But I'm not going to be too pushy. I will just pray for them. Because I do know this. I do know they wrestle with this question. Here's another question. Whoops. Norm, uh, how should we live? Everyone I've ever met says the world is not the way it's supposed to be. So ask them that. Do you think the world is the way it's supposed to be? What do you think is wrong with the world at the heart? What do you think would make it right? Ask those questions and see how people respond. And then say, oh, that's interesting. As a Christian, here's why I believe Everything is not the way it's supposed to be. Here's what I think is wrong with the world. Here's what I think will make it right. And see how they respond to that. It's a very easy thing in a conversation to do. Deliverance. Is there a way out of the mess we are in? Ask someone like this, you know, what are you hoping for will happen in your life? 
or what, what would make your life better? And again, let them talk, listen to what they have to say and say, that's interesting. That would certainly help. Better health, better financial security, a better job. Here's what I found as a Christian, that even when I don't have those things, the closer I get to God, the more secure I am because I know my circumstances might change, but my position with God, my relationship with God gives me stability even when everything else is changing. So what you're doing is you're listening to what they have to say, you're sharing what you believe, and then challenging them on their belief system. Destiny, is there a way to control my life? Many people feel like life is out of control, right? You're married to someone or have a child who's living a destructive way, and, and you think, how do I stop this? How do I change my situation? People wonder these kinds of things. And then finally, higher power. Is there something beyond? You know what's happening? For a long time, we've lived in a world that's becoming increasingly secular. Have you noticed that? God is pushed to the margins. Spiritual things are pushed to the margins. But here, here's the way world religion tends to progress. You have pantheism, all is God. Then you have polytheism, many gods. Then you have monotheism, one god, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. And some people then become atheists. There is no god. But the further you go into atheism, guess what happens? You loop all the way back around here. And now people that were a few years ago atheists, they're into crystals, they're into meditating, they're into grounding. Have you heard of grounding? It's a new practice. You go outside in the morning in your bare feet and you stand in the grass and you connect with the electrical current of the earth. Now there's nothing wrong with saying, I like to go out in my front yard first thing in the morning, whether it's hot or cold, and stand in the grass and just breathe it. That's perfectly fine. But many people, even Christians, are getting connected with this pantheistic idea that what's wrong in my body and spirit is my electrical connections are off, and by standing in the grass with my feet, I'm connecting with the electrical circuits of the earth. My friends, that is neither science nor is it Christian. So people who have been atheists for a long time are doubling back now to neo-pagan religion, Viking religion, new age kind of stuff, and Christianity is getting sucked into it. I do a session on how Eastern thought has infiltrated the West and the church. You'd be amazed at all these different things Christians are involved in that suck them into Eastern religion. I can't have a session without getting in trouble, so I'll just dive right in. Uh, many Christians are in yoga. Now, I'm not against the stretches in the yoga. I do them every day for my back. But if you're involved in yoga, where you greet one another with namaste, you are involving yourself in Hindu religion, whether you think you are or not. All the poses, all the language, it's Hindu explicitly religious language. I have believed that for a long time, and I was in Boston, Massachusetts a few years ago, and was speaking at a church, and there were about 25 Indian people in the church who taught at Harvard and MIT. They were doctors and scientists. And I mentioned yoga, and then I thought, oh boy, I, I hope I'm right in what I'm saying. I think I am, but here are some Indian people who know. And they came up after me, and they said, uh, afterward to talk to me, they said, we are so glad you said that, because as Indians, former Hindus, now Christians... Uh, we're just appalled at how many people in the West do yoga, even Christians, and they participate in the whole shebang, all the language and all that, and it's overtly Hindu. They say, do you know what namaste means? I don't know if you know what namaste is. It's the greeting when you start your yoga session. They said the word namaste means the God within me bows to the God within you. Hmm. You think maybe some Christians might be involved in some things that could be problematic? I think so. And there's lots of other things as well. Uh, talking to some Christian teens who said, yeah, I have crystals in my room because it helps me with my anxiety. That's neither science nor Christian. That's Eastern religion, considering uh, divine power to be in the rocks. So we have to be really careful because even we as Christians can get sucked into this confusing our God who is wholly separate from us, not part of the creation, but who has come down to be one of us, we can start to confuse that. So very quickly then, uh, steps in the, in the apologetic process. And this is, if, if, you, if it would help to have this handy, I have a little 
bookmark you can buy back at the table for a dollar. Just remind you when you're having a conversation with someone, here's where you go with it. F start by showing, them in showing interest in them. So when I have a conversation with an unbeliever, I just start by asking them questions about them. I don't tell them anything about me or what I believe yet. I'm just curious about them. And then I want to begin to ask strategic questions. Do you have a religious background? Who do you think God is or what is he like? Do you know anything about Jesus? Um, ask those strategic questions that get them talking and then enter their world. As they tell me what they believe, it's like walking into a room for the first time or a building where you've never been. Look around. Oh, so this is what New Age religion is. This is interesting. So uh, what do you believe as a New Age person regarding what's right and wrong or the nature of God? Look around their worldview and ask them questions like, what do you believe or how do you answer these things? Here's what happens when you do that. You're showing an interest in their belief system. You're asking them questions. What happens is they are drawn into conversation with you. Why? Because we love to talk about ourselves. We love to talk about what we're interested in, right? I didn't know Clark. Is he back there still or he left? Okay, he went back there. I didn't know him for two seconds before I noticed he had a fishing shirt on, started to ask him about fishing. Do you think he was reluctant to talk about it? No, why? Because he loves it, and I love it too, so there is that instant connection. You start talking to someone about what they believe and, and show curiosity, they will be drawn in. Don't worry about, oh, they're, they're talking so much. Wait, wait, listen, ask questions, and then begin to say, oh, that's interesting. As a Christian, I agree with that or I disagree with that here. And then start sharing your beliefs with them. You would be amazed how many people you are worried about talking to are worth are interested in talking to you and willing to talk to you if you first show interest in them. And then what you want to do in number four is expose any place that they're irrational or contradictory or unlivable. That is, they say things that are a problem. Like, oh, well, that's interesting you say that, but that doesn't seem to make sense in your worldview. Point that out. Number five, present the glory and rationality of the Christian worldview. That's interesting that you can't seem to find you know, a relief from your guilt or your fear of death. Can I tell you what, in, in the Christian faith, what we believe? Can I tell you what Jesus has done? He's died so that we don't have to be afraid of death. And he rose again, he conquered death. This fear of death that you have, the, your answer is Jesus. And then present the, the person and work of Christ. He is God who has come down to show us the way to God. This is essentially what I do in conversations, and this is something every one of you can do. It takes practice. One of the hard things about effective evangelism with, uh, with unbelievers is you should learn a little bit, and then you got to start doing it right away. Right? It's kind of like if you're learning to fly fish or swing a golf club. You should read a little bit, but you got to get out there and start swinging the club and doing this motion back and forth. All the book knowledge won't matter until you start to put it into practice. So can I present a challenge to you this morning? Can I encourage every one of you to pray every day? Couples, pray this together. Lord, in the next two weeks, bring someone into my life that I can start a conversation with, that I can show an interest in who they are and what they believe, with the intent that I hope I can steer the conversation towards spiritual things. And even though I might be scared and nervous and anxious about it, I'm going to love this person like you and have interest in them. And I'm going to talk to them and let's see where it goes. And God, I'm going to trust you that you will open up that conversation for me to talk about spiritual things. And no matter how far it goes, if it only goes five, ten minutes or two hours... I'm going to consider this to be a huge success because I've been able to plant seeds of the gospel. I guarantee if you pray that, God will provide opportunity and you will experience incredible joy where you can say, oh, that was exciting. I was scared. I was nervous. I'm not sure if what I said was exactly right, but that person talked to me for a little while about Jesus or about their soul or about their fears. And hopefully I'll have an ongoing conversation opportunity with this person. I promise you, if you pray for it and take that step of faith, 
you will experience incredible joy because God is doing a great work of saving people in this world. And he invites you and me to participate in that for our joy. Let's pray. Lord, um, we all long to see the unbelievers we know come to faith in Christ. Um, we may have tried before and been discouraged with the response. But I pray, God, that we would, in a relentless way, uh, look at those who don't know you the way you do. As people to be pursued with the love of Christ, with the truth of the scriptures. God, help us to get over our sense of inadequacy, our desire to be respected and admired by others. Help us to see us ourselves as we truly are, ambassadors for the gospel to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus. I pray for every person in this room that in the coming weeks, you would give them opportunities, that they would take those opportunities and experience the joy you have for all of us as we participate in your great work of salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless.